Hello. Thank you for coming. Uh, this will be talk a bit on Kubernetes, but uh, more on uh, the work that's needed to, to transform a startup from a few persons company to a real company with real uh, revenue and a few more people. So first, let me introduce myself. I'm Philip. I'm uh, doing uh, DevOps. I help uh, companies to uh, develop uh, faster, to, to grow up, and still develop fast enough. And um, I do it uh, with helping them with the process for development and uh, with the tooling that helps the developers. We are also teaching with my wife, Nastya, uh, courses for uh, programming and uh, data analysis. And in the past, I co-founded a machine learning startup, and uh, I studied uh, chemical informatics. Uh, but I don't do this anymore. So uh, now I spend most time with uh, Twisto. Uh, Twisto is a financial company. Uh, they do online payments. And uh, one of their features is uh, Twisto Pay, which lets you uh, buy at uh, e-shops and uh, pay after two weeks, when, when you uh, check, check the goods, and uh, if you are not satisfied, you just return them, you don't pay anything. Uh, there is a card, no, MasterCard. It's, it behaves like a credit card. You, you shop for a month, then, then pay, pay after it. Uh, if you buy a lunch for your colleagues, you can then split this easily in the application. Um, and uh, Twist also sells uh, the scoring engine, it's called Nikita. Uh, it sells it, uh, for example, to Alza uh, for their own scoring um, as a service. Uh, we focus a lot on, on technology. Twist lends money, and uh, because it's a startup, it doesn't have uh, all the, the data sources and the bureaucracy like a big, big bank. Uh, but instead, it can look at uh, the online data. Uh, it, it can find about you. And uh, it can decide whether it will give uh, you specifically uh, the, the loan or not in one or two seconds. Uh, and uh, it can do it uh, without, uh, in, in many cases, uh, without uh, the documents, ID cards, or other papers, and still maintain the low fraud and, and default rate. And for this, uh, it relies heavily on being able to, to develop this, this scoring and the related technology. Uh, so it's, it's really a tech-focused startup. Now it, it grows uh, quite quickly. Uh, last year, to entered the second country, it's Poland. Um, there are now about uh, 200 people uh, working for, for Twisto. And, uh, it's, uh, it's growing faster and faster. This year, uh, uh, Twista plans to enter a third market, uh, which will be uh, Romania. But three years ago, when I first came to, to Twista, there were about uh, 20 people in total, seven developers uh, out of it. And uh, uh, from technology point of view, uh, there was just uh, one server in, in colocation. Uh, simple, simple stack, Nginx, uh, Django, Postgres, a bit of Elastic, uh, and uh, one server for, for database backups. So, so if, if the first server fires up, uh, we don't lose anything. We, we don't lose everything, but uh, we can restore somehow from the backups. Uh, if you wanted to deploy a new version of the application, you did, did the git pull on the server and uh, restarted a few services, and that was it. Uh, there was uh, one country, there was no, no payment card. Uh, it was all much simpler. And uh, these were the foundations for today's uh, success. Um, yeah. This simple stack means that uh, the changes that were needed to do were very easy. If you have a small team, you don't have uh, the middleman. You, uh, have the CEO or the product guy talking directly to the developers. If they need to change something in the product to test some hypothesis, it gets done very quickly. The developer develops it, he pushes it to production, 
uh, if something goes wrong, he fixes it, everything is, is okay. The, most of the developers uh, were able to fit uh, the whole system in their head. Um, this kind of stack is really good for uh, really starting starting company because uh, you need to, to make sure that you are developing the right product. And there were a lot of uh, dead ends and a lot of things that really had to change. Um, but uh, there are obviously downsides. The tools are simple and uh, they, they introduce risks. During every deployment, and there were several deployments a day, uh, there was a slight chance uh, of, of downtime during the day because nobody was writing database uh, schema changes in a compatible way. So yeah, it, a few transactions were lost now and then. Uh, the scale was small, it didn't really matter that much. If uh, the, the server, it was two slides ago, if it uh, burnt, burnt up, uh, there would be a day without, without Crystal. Well, not, not as good, but somehow works. Yeah, there, there, are, there are some risks. But still, the benefits outweigh uh, the risks tremendously. The, the ability to make changes for the early stage company is, is really crucial. What is, okay, okay. I'll try to refresh it. Oof. Yeah, that's it. Uh, da -da -da. Yeah, so everything's great. Sun is shining. Why, why change anything, basically? Um, do you have any idea why is why would you want to change this, this state? <laughs> the problem is that uh, the company was not making any money. It was, uh, it was in red. And uh, there was a slight margin on, on each transaction, but it couldn't pay the rent and, and the developers even for the, for the small team. So in order to change this, uh, the company needs to scale, scale up. Um, and with scaling, uh, there are now uh, new, new problems you, you have to solve. First, and this will be the first part of the talk, is resilience. Uh, every downtime now costs much more. If you operate at a bigger scale, uh, you lose more transactions, and it makes sense to uh, invest more in to make the tools more, more robust. The second is scaling the team. You are now not, not focusing on uh, uh, improving the, the efficiency of uh, three developers, uh, but uh, uh, you are uh, focusing on increasing the throughput of the whole team. That means you want to be able to, to hire more people and uh, uh, plug them into the development process and uh, make more features. And the third part is agility. You want to do this all without, without much effect on the, on the original agility. As I described, uh, the deployment several times a day, and uh, the, the ability to debug quickly problems in production. These are, these are really good things, so we would like to keep them. So how to, how to do this? First, let's pick the, the resilience. Uh, this was my initial reaction three years ago. Uh, so how to, how to make it more resilient? It's one server in the collocation. Let's move to cloud. They have the virtual machines, everything is, Auto scaling, so let, let's do this. Uh, there was a bit skepticism at the company. Uh, one one point was about uh, the performance difference, so uh, we started to test it. How do you test the performance uh, for uh, some established application? You can uh, uh, simulate the load based on the real usage data. You just uh, pick the, the logs from the web servers and uh, you see how the traffic pattern looks like. This was, uh, there was a spike in the morning, then uh, during the noon, uh, people were at lunch and not ordering much, uh, and uh, uh, in the afternoon, there was a smaller spike. Uh, we saw what things people are doing, actually, uh, and uh, simulated uh, the, uh, 
the traffic uh, with the help of the locust tool. And this is uh, something where you write Python code to, to simulate uh, the behavior of users, and uh, it helps you uh, simulate uh, multi-step interactions. For example, going through the registration process, uh, the computation-intensive step is at the end, so we had to simulate uh, people submitting uh, a, few, a few things um, during the process, and then hitting, okay, I, I register. Uh, and when you, ha when you have the simulated traffic, you can just uh, multiply it uh, 10 times, 50 times, 300 times, and see where the application breaks. So where did it break? Uh, it broke in latency. When we moved to a general purpose instance, I think it was uh, DigitalOcean, uh, the first thing we tried, uh, the latency of the home page rendering went from 60 milliseconds to 300 milliseconds. Uh, this was because uh, there was a lot of uh, Django templating uh, going on on the, on the home page, and we found out that we had a really powerful CPU in the, in the dedicated server. And uh, the, it ran on much higher frequency than, than the, the virtual machines uh, in DigitalOcean. And yeah, like we could work with 300 milliseconds, we could optimize it somehow, but yeah, does it make real sense? Uh, similar story with, with the database. Uh, the elastic block storage, uh, which is available on Amazon, which is a uh, disk on some disk array, it's, it's great. You can add capacity, uh, but uh, the performance is not as good as, as, the, as the local disks. So for the database, where, which you can really scale only vertically, because, like buying more powerful hardware, uh, this was also, it gave us a pause a bit. And the third is uh, memory costs, because the, the application was quite memory hungry, because there was a lot of cheap memory in the server, so nobody optimized it really. Um, so uh, with these test results, uh, we found out that uh, the Amazon was, was doable, but costly, which would affect the scaling. Like if we want to, to increase the, the load many times, um, it would cost us. And uh, the cost difference was uh, uh, the way that uh, it could pay for, uh, let's say, two engineers maybe. And uh, so, so either we would invest in app optimization or we would pay this uh, to, to the service provider. Uh, let's see how uh, moving to cloud uh, matches the goal we had. Uh, the app can be made more, more resilient. We could have auto scaling. Uh, we would have some investment in, in setting up the tooling, but yeah, it would work somehow. Scaling the app, yeah, it would work. We would pay for it. Um, and agility, uh, does the cloud help us with, with the agility? We couldn't see how it maps directly uh, to, to keeping, keeping the, the agility. So we took a step back and uh, thought, what is it what makes uh, the development easy and, uh, and fast? First thing is uh, to have uh, quick, quick de deployments. Uh, if, if I'm able to uh, put a bug in production and then fix it five minutes later, I'm much more likely to, uh, to actually uh, do several deployments a day, try, try new features uh, quickly. I do testing, but I focus uh, mostly on uh, if the feature is, is right, rather than absolutely nothing has to break. Testing to this level has a cost. So having a quick deployment to fix the bugs has, uh, has value. If I have a monolithic application, I can run everything locally. Uh, I can, I can test, uh, test all the features together. This is, uh, this is nice. It's nice to have cheap resources. It's a really different thing if I have to optimize the app now or if I have to optimize the app uh, half year later. It's a technical debt, but uh, if I have a low interest rate, uh, it, it, makes, uh, it makes the uh, development uh, much, much more fun and much, uh, much easier, uh, because some of the things will turn out that they don't need to be optimized. The feature will uh, be end of life in half a year. Uh, the bottleneck will not be as, as bad as, as we thought. So yeah, cheap resources really help with, uh, with the development. And the last thing is visibility into production. 
with the old server, we had uh, all logs in one place at the server. And uh, if, you, if you were debugging something, you had one place where to look if something, something goes wrong. Uh, so uh, this is something we also want to maintain. So with, uh, with these requirements, um, we finally uh, did this kind of architecture. We have a Kubernetes cluster with uh, five workers uh, in, the, in the data center uh, on uh, bare, bare metal servers. Uh, we have a beefy uh, database, database server uh, with, some, with some backup, uh, but uh, we just said, okay, so let's, uh, let's make the server as redundant as possible inside the hardware, so we will likely not hit uh, the problem that, that it, it breaks down. Uh, we, and, and then we, uh, we use uh, some external services. We, we use uh, uh, Amazon for uh, file storage and, and for, for the backups. We use uh, rented uh, HA proxy as, as a service uh, from, the, from the data center. Uh, so here, uh, the, the rented services and the Kubernetes give us uh, the, the resilience, while uh, the, uh, the dedicated service in the data center give us uh, the cheap resources. The benefits uh, of the cloud are that you can, there's no sales pers person through which you have to go if you want uh, just uh, another server. This is, this is a big benefit. Um, but it's, let's say, four times, four times more, more costly. You have uh, extra services. The big pain with uh, the bare metal service is ordering the disks, the hard drives. Uh, you have to plan the capacity. The servers don't, uh, don't uh, the servers cannot house infinite uh, amount of disks. And, uh, and this is uh, actually the biggest, uh, biggest pain point, uh, the, the physical, physical hard drives. And uh, also uh, the dedicated servers help us uh, that we sometimes need custom hardware. Like for Poland, uh, there is uh, electronic signature token, uh, which we just, have to plug somewhere to a server, uh, so we need to have dedicated servers somewhere, um, and it works on Windows, but it's another story. Uh, here is just for your information, uh, the, uh, the cloud providers and the dedicated providers which, with which I have uh, some experience ordered left is the brand name cloud. They have the most services, they are usually the, uh, the most pricey. Uh, on the right, uh, there are uh, usually smaller companies who offer dedicated servers uh, without as many managed services. Sometimes you can negotiate a special thing, like we have the, the load balancer, but uh, usually they don't advertise it that much, and you have the salespeople there often. And in the middle, uh, there is a cheaper cloud with uh, maybe managed database, managed uh, storage, but not much on top of that. So uh, yeah, this is uh, how, how we uh, manage the, the resilience. The second thing is uh, scaling the team. How to move from a few people with the simple tools to uh, bigger teams uh, with uh, specialists uh, who cannot work in isolation, but together they put uh, up a more sophisticated product. First, you may have heard that API is something machine uses to talk to another machine. Who has heard this, this kind of definition? It's, it's wrong. API is something people use to talk to, to other people, especially the, the developers of one service to talk to developers of the other service. API is a contract uh, between people uh, that I will maintain stability of, of this, uh, um, of, of this uh, interface. Uh, so you can, you can depend on it. That means that the team maintaining the API has uh, more work, but in the end, uh, for the whole company, uh, this, uh, this means that more people uh, can, can take part efficiently in uh, developing the, the product. 
Uh, for the front end, uh, Twista has uh, three, three applications, iOS, Android, and uh, web application. And in the beginning, uh, the web application was uh, based on the Django templates rendered to HTML. And it's moving uh, to uh, React uh, JavaScript uh, single page application. And all of the three applications are using now the same uh, GraphQL API to talk to the backend. That means uh, that the people who uh, make changes in the, in the backend code don't need to deal with uh, the templating and HTML and this sort of stuff. Another thing is to pull in other teams from the company to the development. Uh, for as, as I mentioned, uh, the, the risk engine, uh, which needs to model if you specifically are going to pay for the loan uh, Twista gives you, uh, there are some statistical, statistical models. First, when the company was really small, the guy, the data scientist who developed the model, just created a pull request. The model got hard-coded into the application, and everything was fine. It was not enough later, because uh, it slowed him down, and nobody really understood what this in the pull request any, anyway. Uh, so uh, Twista made uh, the uh, models trainable in the application. On the real data, there, there was a little machine learning studio in the application, and uh, you could uh, train, train your models there. Again, it was not enough. Uh, so uh, now uh, the, the data scientists uh, develop the models in their own environment. They make a package out of the model, upload them to the application, and the application just executes uh, the model uh, during runtime. Um, Similar thing uh, for uh, the parameters. There's a lot of parameters. Uh, the individual e-shops have different uh, risk profiles, like electronics is more risky than, uh, I don't know, diapers. Um, individual people have their monthly limits adjusted uh, based on their history. And uh, in the beginning, uh, there were a lot of uh, knobs and uh, inputs in the admin console, uh, but uh, Later, uh, we moved to uh, creating a batch API, so the risk team can, can call the API, change things in mass, and uh, now they are maintaining actually an active service which takes part in the registration process, and uh, uh, it responds uh, based on the real request uh, from, from the customers. Uh, they have a dedicated namespace in, in Kubernetes. Uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, a bit tough for uh, the data scientists to, to be taught how to deploy to Kubernetes, what is Docker and, and everything, but they can manage because they see the, the benefit. They, they, can, they can really uh, maintain their own, own service without waiting for another team. A lot of the work uh, we as DevOps do is that uh, we try to remove uh, waiting for some other people. So uh, with, with Kubernetes, it's easy to create microservices. We have a few of them, uh, but uh, uh, the, the decision whether to create another one, for me, it's, it's uh, usually, is there a team who is willing to take care of this new microservice and, uh, and maintain it, and does it bring them any, any benefit? Uh, again, it's, it's about uh, isolation between the teams, like the APIs. Uh, it doesn't make much sense to, to break up one monolith into two microservices or more microservices if there still, we, still will be one team which, uh, who manages uh, the, uh, the whole uh, cluster of the microservices. And if you need to do changes across multiple microservices, you want to develop a feature. Uh, doesn't make much, much sense. But if there is a separated team, like a marketing team who wants to create their own marketing pages, or the, the risk team who wants to, uh, to shape the, the registration process, uh, that's the, the ideal case uh, for, for the microservices. And the third part of the, of the talk is about uh, keeping agility. Uh, in, in our case, uh, a part of this uh, managing, managing the process, uh, we have uh, the, uh, the teams uh, which are empowered to, to de de deliver uh, the whole feature um, inside this one team. 
but here I will focus more from uh, on the tooling perspective, and uh, I will show what tools we we have to uh, help the, the developers deliver the features. First thing is to automate uh, the deployment. Uh, the, the deployment is, uh, is done several times a day usually, and the features are, are delivered uh, as they are ready. Sometimes behind the feature flag, sometimes just deploy the version. And uh, there is a custom script uh, which uh, checks uh, CI if, if this, this version is, is okay, updates uh, front-end uh, server so it serves uh, newer uh, static files, then changes in the database schema. We have a tool uh, which checks uh, at the time of uh, commits, like in, during the unit tests, uh, whether the schema changes you wrote are compatible with the, with the previous code which, which was running on the servers. So uh, this should not disrupt uh, the running application much. Um, then uh, we, we update the backend and then we notify to Slack uh, that there is a new, new deployment and what features uh, were, were deployed. This is also useful for notifying uh, the, the other teams in the company, for example, support that something has landed. Now people will call you about this. Um, one thing that uh, got worse uh, from the, the old times with the single server is that the time to production, you find out that there is a bug in production. You commit the fix, someone reviews the fix for you, uh, it may take a few minutes, it may take an hour, who knows. Uh, but then, in the old server, you did git pull, restart, and everything was, was fine, up and running. If you found out that there was, there was a mistake in your fix, you just uh, repeated the process, and in a few minutes, uh, you were going. Now, uh, building the, the Docker images, uploading them to Docker Hub, downloading them from, the, from Docker Hub to, uh, to the production servers, uh, restarting all the, all the containers, everything, it can take uh, 20, 30 minutes. So this is not ideal, and yeah, and I, I forgot, uh, sometimes uh, Docker Hub can be really, really slow, uh, like uh, dialed connection slow. And uh, uh, to fight this, we are now working on a, a hotfix uh, process, which means uh, that uh, uh, the, the hotfix uh, deployments will just download a patch set from, from GitHub, and uh, uh, you will just restart the services and you don't have to, to build, build uh, all the new container images. Uh, you cannot do everything with uh, just, just patching the code, but uh, if, you, if you have a bug in your logic somewhere, this can, uh, this can sh dramatically uh, shorten the time, uh, the time to production, like from 30 minutes to under a minute. And, uh, Again, the tooling tells you if the change you are trying to, to apply as a hotfix makes extra sense, if it's safe for, for hotfixing, or if there are ch changes to the database that you need to do outside manually, or what, what you need to do extra. This is, every, this is all that the tools can, can tell you. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that uh, in this kind of organization, uh, the developers themselves uh, deploy the code. It's not the ops ops uh, organization, it's not the DevOps who deploy the code, it's the developers themselves. So uh, they need to be told uh, if something goes, goes wrong and they, they need to have the visibility into, into production uh, to be able to diagnose and, and debug the problems. And they, they usually do fine. In the, in the beginning with the Kubernetes and Docker, uh, like half of the developers didn't uh, have any experience with the Docker before, uh, but they, they pretty much uh, caught, caught up to speed. Uh, uh, the developers are able uh, to test uh, their features on a real scale of the database. We have a half terabyte uh, database uh, in, in Postgres, and uh, they are able to get uh, snapshots of this database, either anonymized uh, for testing, or in some cases, uh, not anonymized uh, for debugging uh, some severe production issues, they can, they can get the snapshot in five seconds. 
Uh, this is because we maintain uh, a replica of the database on a development server, and uh, with uh, uh, Linux uh, logical volume manager, uh, we can take uh, this copy on write uh, snapshot and uh, start uh, start a fresh fresh database uh, for for the testing. Uh, for the database, it looks like uh, if uh, somebody pulled the uh, power plug and uh, it just crashed, uh, and uh, now it's it's booting after after a crash, and uh, Postgres is quite quick with the recovery after after this. Uh, uh, this power outage. So uh, each developer ha has their own, own personal sandbox, um, and uh, they uh, like almost almost all of them all of them uses it instead of uh, a smaller uh, database with uh, with uh, some data fixtures which they which they were using before on their uh, local machines. Another uh, widely used uh, feature is. Uh, multiple staging environments. We don't have any single staging environment. Uh, but the developer or anybody in the company can uh, enter a branch name or commit, commit ID into, uh, uh, into an input field, press submit, and in 10 minutes, they get a public, publicly accessible uh, copy of the production production environment with, with all the services running, and uh, they can test uh, their features. They can uh, show it to, to, uh, to external people. Uh, they can uh, perform load testing. They, uh, they can test uh, integration with external services, which need to call, call webhooks uh, on our servers. Uh, there, are, there are now about, uh, I don't know, seven or eight uh, staging environments running at, at, this, at this very moment. When the, when the person is done with it, he just moves it to trash. And uh, for these tools, we rely a lot on the cloud. Uh, either for the higher value add services like uh, S3 or, or uh, Google Firebase, uh, we, we use uh, virtual machines in, in AWS for the lean applications because it's much less hassle than, than uh, with the dedicated servers. We have uh, the internal, tool, internal tooling there, uh, like uh, Wi-Fi portal, VPN stuff. Uh, there is a service which uh, unlocks uh, the, the, encryption, the hard drive encryption for the physical servers. Uh, we have uh, Jenkins workers uh, in uh, spot instances in Amazon. Uh, and uh, we use uh, AWS also for uh, the temporary resources, like, uh, like these uh, staging environments I described uh, a moment ago. So these are the tools uh, which uh, gives, uh, give us uh, the, the agility, even if the team grows. Uh, in the beginning, for example, with the database, the database was small. It if somebody had to, to debug a problem uh, with, with the production data, which manifested with, for some customers, uh, they could download all the 20 gigabytes of the database and uh, run experiments. Now it's, it's not feasible, but, but we have uh, better tools for this. So to sum, sum it up, uh, what I wanted to say with, with this talk uh, is uh, that you first need to know what the problems are. Uh, when I came first to, uh, to Twista, uh, the definition of the problems were, was a bit hazy. Uh, they knew they want to scale. They didn't know really uh, what, what it means in terms of uh, traffic, developers, I think. So the first part is define, define what, what the problem is, then pick one problem, prototype, measure, invest a lot of the internal tooling, this is uh, what, uh, what really paid, paid off for us. Uh, there are now uh, five people uh, from the 40 developers who work mostly on the internal tooling and uh, it really uh, brings the, the value uh, that it uh, increases the productivity uh, of the, the rest of the developers by quite a high margin. And uh, the most important point is uh, to take the risks. Uh, the risk has to be calculated. Uh, there has to be some upside. Like if I take the risks, 
if I take, take this risk, what do I gain? Uh, does it actually bring me anything in terms of speed, money, whatever? And uh, there has to be uh, a limit on the downside. Like, if the bet goes bad, what happens? If I lose the server because I have just one, what, 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 goes, what goes wrong? Can I recover from it? So, uh, yeah, if the risk is calculated, if you know what is the upside, why you are taking the risk, and uh, if uh, you know what is the downside, like the, the limits of, of the losses you can suffer from this risk, you can decide that you want to take this risk. And without the risks, you cannot do agile development at all. Thank you for your attention. And uh, now, now I think we have uh, room for questions and answers. So the first question was uh, on the tooling we use. Uh, so uh, to manage uh, the servers, we use uh, Ansible. And uh, we use uh, Prometheus for, for monitoring, uh, Elasticsearch, uh, Logstash, uh, Kibana uh, for, for, the, for the logs. We have about uh, 40 gigabytes of logs uh, generated per day. Uh, and uh, we use uh, Pager, Pager Duty and Sentry uh, for, for notifications. Uh, we use a lot of Slack. Uh, we have some Slack bots. Uh, I, if you have any specific area in, in mind, uh, I, I can share other tools, but I'm not sure if. Yeah, OK. Uh huh. OK. So, uh, yeah, we, we use, uh, uh, with, with the Prometheus, we, we monitor uh, mostly uh, the, the metrics uh, which are concerning the health of the physical servers, like uh, how many memory do they have, uh, how, if the, is the CPU overloaded or, or not, uh, excuse me, is the CPU overloaded or not, uh, and uh, how, many, how much disk space do we have, and then also the application metrics. Do we get any, did, did we get any new orders in the past 30, 30 minutes? If not, something is probably wrong. Um, uh, do, there are a few more specific, specific application-specific uh, uh, metrics, uh, length of the, the background queues, and, and so on. And uh, the second question was? Status page. Yeah, we, we don't have a status page uh, because uh, the people who uh, use, uh, uh, use Twister usually don't come to, to our pages, but they try to pay somewhere. So uh, we communicate uh, via error messages and uh, error pages, and uh, we also try to make uh, sure uh, that uh, the payment by the physical payment cards or online payment by the MasterCard uh, always always works. Uh, there are several layers uh, which which can approve approve the the payment. So we didn't have any any big big issues with the critical critical part. And yeah, we do have uh, internal SLAs. Uh, we are now more or less starting to formalize them. Uh, especially for the services uh, we as DevOps uh, provide to, to the other parts of the company. Uh, yeah. and, and, and we have to report uh, SLAs back to the Czech National Bank uh, every month, uh, how, how we met them, but they are quite formal ones and they don't really have to match the actual customer experience. Any other question? Uh, 
Yeah, uh, we considered it. We considered it. Uh, we'll probably do it at some point. Uh, probably uh, we will have. Uh, um, in the Kubernetes cluster, we will have a repository for the production images. Uh, the issue is that uh, um, first, as I was showing the, the pipeline here, the CI build and test, it will still take like 15 minutes uh, to go to, to production if we want the full uh, Docker build and tests. And, uh, we decided that the priority for now is uh, to skip as much as possible uh, to do the hotfix. But yeah, we'll probably probably do this. The Docker Hub for now it's very cheap, and pr uh, I think uh, we will move to to AWS uh, registry for the supporting images and to our own registry for the, the production ones. But so far, uh, there are other priorities. Uh, service mesh, I don't uh, have uh, experience with that. I, I assume it's something more like Heroku, or uh, is it more? Is it something uh, like Heroku, or no, Istio. Istio. Istio? Oh, sorry, Istio. Yeah, okay, I, yeah, I, I get it. Yeah. Uh, so far, we we didn't uh, need uh, to to use the the service mesh. Uh, Kubernetes has the layer three uh, networking uh, on TCP IP level. Um, and uh, it has been okay for us uh, so far. Uh, now we can see uh, the, the benefits, uh, for example, of Istio or, or ser services like that uh, for the communication uh, between services which are managed uh, by different teams. So for example, uh, to add uh, encryption uh, between, between the services, uh, this is something we are, we are looking, uh, looking into. But we are we are not using it yet. Uh, the slides, if you are interested, will be probably uh, in near near the the talk annotation. But if you want to check them earlier, they are at the Bitly. Yeah. Okay. Any other question? Thank you all.